going to be in the little epistle of 1 John chapter 2 with our message today. 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter number 2. And I want to begin reading verse number 18. You notice how that verse 18 begins with little children. You notice in the early part of the, this epistle, 1 John, he talks about uh, groups of people. He, he says in verse 1 of chapter 2, my little children, my little children. And we have references to young men. And uh, then we have uh, references to fathers, and uh, here the, the references are not so much to literal young men and literal children, it's all about spiritual young men, and because of how he defines them, he describes them, why he's calling them uh, little children and so forth, and here he's not talking about just the little kids in the church, he's talking to those who are new converts, those who are new in the Christian life, those who are new in the family of God, little children. And he, and he tells little children, it is the last time. And as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now are there many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. But ye have an unction from the Holy One, and ye know all things. I have not written unto you because ye know not the truth, but because ye know it, and that no lie is of the truth. Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father. But he that acknowledgeth the Son hath the Father also. Our Father, we pray for your leadership with the message today. We pray that you will guide and direct us and speak through our hearts. And Lord, give us wisdom, give us guidance and direction. And Lord, uh, give us stability in our Christian life, Lord. It seems to be uh, we are at a time of such... Uh, lack of stability. People's lives are in turmoil. Uh, every day, different things affecting them. Pray that you'll help us now, Lord, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, in chapters two, chapter 2 here, in verse 18 through 29, it's dealing with the conflict between truth and error. You know, there, there is something that's true. You have, today, there is, a, uh, there is a, an idea, a philosophy called pragmatism, and then and, and, and you have situational ethics, and you have these different philosophies, and the idea is, what's right for you may not be right for me. Have you ever tried to tell somebody the Bible, and they say, well, that's what's right for you, but it's not right for me. Truth is truth. It doesn't change from person to person. Whatever's true is true. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He didn't say, well, I'm the truth for you, but I'm not the truth for you. Truth is truth. And, and th the argument today is there are no absolutes. That it's all to be just uh, any way you want to interpret it. And I'm glad the Bible says that the Scriptures know not of any private interpretation. We're not going to seek the interpretation that the author has. If, you know, you've been one of those churches that our Sunday school classes that read the text and then go around and what does that mean to you? What does that mean to you? What does it what doesn't matter what that means to you or me? What does it say? Right. That's what it means. But it, it, but it's all about a private interpretation. And that's a very dangerous thing because with every private interpretation, you move just a little further from the truth. I always like to refer to somebody that's going to teach to do research and study it and know what they're talking about. And, and then we listen and evaluate whether what they're saying is correct or not. But uh, and we're not going to just shut our brain off. But the truth is, uh, we need to realize there is the truth. The truth. Now, in this passage, we're talking about this battle between truth and untruth about what is right and what is a lie, as he calls it here. And he says that one day the Antichrist is going to come. 
But the reason he brings that up because that is the epitome of lies. That is the epitome of all untruth is the propaganda of the Antichrist. But then it tells us that, well, even though we know that, that little children in the last time, as you have heard, that Antichrist shall come, even now are there many Antichrists, whereby we know that it's the last time. There are many Antichrists. There is the Antichrist, and then there's the many Antichrists. Now, what, who is he talking about? These many Antichrists. It's those who, under the name of religion, under the name of Christianity, under the name of, of saying they believe the Bible, preaching, teaching, saying things that are untrue. They are not the truth. They are lies. And you say, well, why would somebody take up the Bible, pick it up and read it, and then preach lies? Some are trying to build their own little kingdom on earth and get a following that follows them. And, and so they'll say, I have the only interpretation. That for thousands of years, nobody really understood that verse until God showed me. And so I, I'm the only one that has the correct interpretation of that passage of Scripture. Hogwash. The Word of God clearly defines itself. When somebody comes out and says, I had a new revelation on that, uh, whether it's on television, whether it's in a Christian program, uh, shut it off. Shut it up. We're not looking for a new revelation. We want the old revelation. Right. We want the revelation of God, not something new, because we understand there are many antichrists that are coming in the last days, and they're saying, this is what's right. That is what's right. Take the old path. That's the one that's right. The one that's been walked by many people uh, hundreds of times. The one who followed the course of the Scripture many times. That's the truth. It's been proven and not something that's new and untested, the things that are proven. So in this passage, he breaks it down. He talks about this crisis that's faced by every single believer. He says in verse 18, Little children, this last time, and, ye, and as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now are there many Antichrists, whereby we know that it's the last time. They went out from us, but they were not of us, for they had not been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us, but they went out, that they might be made manifest that they were not of us. Now what is he talking about here? He's talking about the crisis that you and I have to deal with in our Christian life, taking our stand with the truth of the Word of God, that there are many, well, what we look at as well-meaning people, what we would call good people, who take other views. They'll take a view that's not according to Scripture. You say, but they're, they're good people. They're good neighbors. They, they are not of us. And what, what he's saying here, there is a division within humanity. Today, there are so many different divisions. People want to divide people up by, by their social economic level. You know, we, there are some people who want to set the poor against the rich and the rich against the poor. Listen, uh, there's, if you're rich, God bless you. If you're poor, God bless you. I mean, there are advantages and disadvantages of both. Uh, we'll find that there are certain temptations that the rich have that the poor do not. You know, you ever have somebody that have a really serious addiction and suddenly they come into a bunch of money? It destroys them. Because they're not used to facing that set of temptations. And so there are advantages of being poor and there are advantages of being rich. Uh, and, but the thing is, just be faithful to God and, and serve God and respect one another. Then there are those who like to divide people up racially. Oh, they're constantly trying to stir up turmoil. May I say this, uh, and I, I stand behind this from the Scripture, the only race I find in the Bible is the human race. The human race. That's it. There is, somebody said, well, what about setting this group against that group? That is not race. You kick everybody in this room. And, uh, look at your skin. Okay? Somebody said, you're white. I'm not white. I'm kind of pink. All right? <laughs> and and no, no matter what the color of your skin is, do you realize that you came from Adam and Eve? That's right. Come on. Preacher. We have common ancestors. That's right. Grandma and Grandpa, Adam and Eve. Uh -huh. But even closer than that, do you realize that we came from Noah and his family? Yes, sir. Yeah. Every one of us. That's right. Every one of us. And, but yet, there are those who like to divide people up and keep them in strife toward one another, keep them fussing with one another. And don't fall into that. Say, they're just not of us. I'm not going to follow that path. 
Don't divide people up that way. And, there, and, and understand, I, I do believe there are cultural differences, and we have to respect cultural differences. And, uh, you know, if you, if you have a group of people and they've developed a culture over hundreds of years, they're, they're different. It's not about the color of their skin. It's about the culture. And that culture developed many times around uh, the uh, environment, where those people live, the food sources that were there, and uh, and, and certain uh, things in their history that took place. And so there's a certain culture, but it's not race. You know where we get the idea of race? Chucky Darwin. Oh, Chucky Darwin's book. Uh, you read his. You don't even have to read the book. You get Charles Darwin's book, open up the front cover, and read the title. You see, uh, it won't have the whole title in the front of the book. The whole title says that it was for the that it talks about the uh, uh, the struggle of the uh, of the races. He believed certain races were more highly evolved than others. He believed people had dark skin were lower in the evolution chain. Yeah. And uh, they, have you ever been to the Smithsonian and see what those half apes uh -huh. and half man things, yeah. which didn't exist by the way? And you see, what color skin do they give them? Have you ever seen one of them have white skin? No. No? You know where that came from? That came from old Chucky Darwin. And you know who took it a little farther? A fellow named Adolf Hitler. Yeah. He built on what Charles Darwin said, and in the scientific community today, many of them have followed suit with it. Believe me, there are certain people more highly involved because of the color of their skin. Nonsense. People want to divide that way. But there is a division. And it's a division that most people do not want to talk about. The division has to do, where do you stand in relationship to this book? Oh, the yes. Word of God. Yeah. There are believers and non-believers. And we understand, there's one day, there is believers in Jesus Christ, those who believe the Word of God, we're going to walk on streets of gold. Amen. We're going to share eternity together in heaven. Yes, we're going to be with the Lord Jesus Christ, and we're going to live there and dwell with Him. But for the unbeliever, there's a great division. There's a place called the Lake of Fire. Somebody says, oh, you don't believe in that? I have to, because my Bible talks about it. And there is a place called hell, and believers and unbelievers are going to be divided and for all eternity. There is a division. Has nothing to do with color of skin. Has nothing to do with uh, well. Has to do with what have you done with Jesus? That's what it's based upon. And yet, that, that is not where the divisions want to be. Here in this passage of Scripture, he said, the many antichrists have come, but there's a great crisis for every believer that, that we have to be careful we don't get caught up in these things that will pull us one way or the other. And an antichrist will use it to get us sidetracked. Get us off course. These who propagate lies, things that are untrue. Uh, then notice in, in verse, not only the Christ is faced by the believer, verse 20 through 21, it, it, notice it says, he talks about the resources of the believer to know what's right. But ye have an unction from the Holy One, and ye know all things. He says, but God lives inside of you. You've got the Holy Spirit Somebody said, what's the unction? One fellow said, I don't know what it is, but I know what it ain't. And, uh, you know, when you, don't, when you do not have that guide, the comforter, the Holy Spirit leading you into what's right, thank God you have that. Uh, some of you know what I'm talking about. When you prayed about something, and there's that sense of the Spirit of God leading you to do something or not do something. You may not even understand why, but you have that unction inside of you. Now, the unsaved world doesn't have that. You say, well, you ever talk to some unsaved people and they say the dumbest things? Yeah. And you wonder, well, how could you even say that with a straight face? You know what? Because they don't have the unction inside them. They don't have the Spirit of God showing them right now. So the whole world of, of error, it just looks like even. It's just one error over another error. They don't know. They sincerely don't know. I was talking to someone at the fair last night. Uh, this boy just uh, graduated from a college out west and he's he's into uh, genetic science and, and he's got a, probably a great career ahead of him a very smart young man but his grandfather used to be over to nursing home and we got to know him a little bit from being there very bright young man and we, he and I were talking about how you can't even have a rational conversation with people anymore if they don't agree with you they hate you well why can't we just disagree on this and talk about why we disagree no you're stupid 
How can you reason with somebody like that? But you understand that's where we are. And because it is the last time. And there are many antichrists at work. Some of them are in the media. Some of them are in politics. Some are in academia. Some of them are in pulpits. And people are confused. They don't know. And we find we, he's warning us we have a resource in that we have the indwelling Holy Spirit and you know who the indwelling Holy Spirit he's the author of the Bible yes, sir. and he'll show you he'll lead you into all truth he, he's, and notice here verse 20 I have not written unto you because you know not the truth but because you know it and that no lie is of the truth so we have resources number three in this conflict between truth and error there is a criteria that we go by as a true believer who is a liar? But he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ. Now, you stop and think about what that verse just said. If a politician says they do not believe that Jesus is the Savior, you just put a big L up there, not loser, but liar. Yeah. He's a liar. You anybody that denies Jesus Christ is a liar. If someone stands behind the pulpit and says there are many ways to heaven, that's a lie. I, my first pastor was not saved. And uh, I got saved at a revival meeting, but I went and started attending another church. And my first pastor, I remember the last sermon that he preached behind the pulpit where I was attending as a teenage boy, and he preached on the seven ways to heaven. Huh. The only problem with that, he's got six too many. That's right. There's only one way. And that's Jesus. That's right. But he said one way to get to heaven is to give all your money to the poor. And that'll let you get into heaven. God what you do. He said if you follow the golden rule, you can get into heaven. He said if you keep the Ten Commandments, that'll get you into heaven. And he, he had a whole list of different things. He said just do unto others. If you'd have to do it, you'll get into heaven. If you're good, that way you're bad, you'll get into heaven. There's only one way, and that's Jesus. All those are false ways. He's a liar. That's right. He's a liar. I was with him one night when one of my friends, I didn't fully, you know, as a new convert, you don't understand these things. You think, well, everybody preaches and teaches the same thing. And I brought one of my friends from school, and Max wanted to get saved. That's the preacher. Max wants to get saved. And the preacher said something like this. He said, that's nice, Max. That's nice. And turned and walked away. Oh my God. And I said, preacher, he wants to get saved now. And he said, well, Max, I'm still working on that myself. Uh -huh. That's what the pastor said. And I'm saying, you got to understand that in pulpits around this world, in many places, there are preachers that are liars. They're propagating a message that's not the truth of the Word of God. And we find the criteria that we have. The truth. He said, he who is a liar, but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ, he is an antichrist. That's right. That denieth the Father and the Son. To deny God makes you an antichrist. But my say, well, no, I'm an agnostic. No, it starts with A, but it's not agnostic. Yeah. Antichrist. Come on. And um, so, well, if I don't believe it was a God, then you are an antichrist. Now, you see, there's very clear divisions here. And you say, preacher, you're being divisive. The truth divides. Yeah. Isn't it interesting? Jesus came into this world, and for those who know him, he's the great unifier. Don't you love it when you travel, you go to some other city you've never been to before, and you're amongst a group of people you've never met before. In a little while, you find out you make friends quickly with somebody who knows the same God you know, and pretty soon you're fellowshipping together. It's like you've known each other for years because you know the Lord. But then you can be in your own neighborhood at your own family reunion with somebody who doesn't know the Lord, and they seem like they're a million miles away because they do not understand your love for Jesus Christ. And so we see the, the criteria for the, the true believer in verse 26 through 28. Notice with me. Verse 26 through 28, he says to us, um, These things have I written unto you concerning them that seduce you, but the anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you, and ye need not that any man teach you, but as the same anointing teacheth you of all things, and is truth and is no lie, even as I have. I have taught you, you shall abide in him. Now he's not saying you shouldn't have teachers, but what he's saying is you will know when it's right or not because you've got the Holy Spirit teaching you. 
Paul said, I taught you, but you had the Spirit of God teaching. You know what I taught you was right because God confirmed it in your heart that I was telling you the truth. The summary of the teaching. And then, verse 29, the practice of righteousness. If you know that He is righteous, you know that everyone that doeth righteousness is born of God. Those who are born of God, those who are saved, uh, that's who you look to. Uh, and uh, that's where you'll find truth, not in those who are unbelievers. That's why in uh, Psalm 1 it says, Blessed is the man mm -hmm. that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. In other words, you don't take advice from people who are not saved. <coughs> walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. Notice what he said, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. Or, or stand, uh, and sitteth in the seat of the but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and his law that he meditate today. And I know I left that phrase there. But the, you get the idea. There's certain kinds of people you don't listen to because New Testament says they're antichrist. Now, does that mean you hate them? No. You just recognize that what they say is not truth. You're to love them and you're to pray for them because you don't want them to remain antichrist. You want them to know Christ. Amen. Now, we're looking at this matter of the essential church. Right. And in this context, in this passage today, I want to talk to you a little bit about the, the, the role of the local church in this, uh, this passage and how we are practice this passage and understand truth and error in our day. And I'm going to give you a title that I, I promise you, you've probably never heard a sermon by this title before. How to Leave a Church. How to Leave a Church. How to Leave a Church. Now follow with me. As we look at this matter, the, this conflict, there are times when it's important to leave a church. And you'll hear some people say, well, no, you should never leave. I, I talk to people sometimes, they say, well, you know, our church... It's a way gotten off course. It's not right anymore. And they said, but we go there because that's where my grandfather used to go. My grandma uh, used to go there. They're buried in this little cemetery out there in the country. And I said, get a shovel. They probably don't want to be there either. Yeah. You know, get out. Get out of there. Don't stay in a church just because that's where your, your family once went. Here's why. Every institution is changing with every passing day. Every institution is changing. Uh, some of you, uh, some of you maybe went to a college. I, I went to Christian colleges. But one Christian college does not exist anymore, and it was one of the larger Christian colleges in the nation at the time. The other Christian college I cannot recommend because they wavered and moved away from where they once stood. Churches change. Sometimes they're changing for the good. Sometimes they're changing for the bad. And at some point, when it's changing for the bad, you have to say, enough. I must leave. And listen, we need to understand the proper reasons to leave a church, and there are. And the proper way to leave a church. And you say, preacher, you preach this because you want us to leave? No, no. I, what I do want you to know, if the day comes you need to leave, you know how to leave. Many people do not know how. They don't, they don't know how to properly uh, leave a church. They, 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 they cause so much harm to the cause of Christ and the way they leave a church. Now, uh, we understand because of reality that there is a struggle of believers and unbelievers sometimes both calling themselves Christian or Christendom. Let me give you an example. In Matthew chapter 13, the Bible says that it, there's a parable there. The first parable is about the sower going forth to sow seed. Right? He's sowing seed and some of it falls on the wayside and some of it falls on good ground and so forth. You know the parable. But then there's the second parable and he tells us in that first parable the seed is the Word of God. That's what the seed represents being sold, uh, as, as sold out around the world. Some believe, some do not believe as Jesus is, is the great sower and then we as we follow Him sow His seed, the Word of God. It, it, but there's a second parable. And he says in the second parable and it's and each one of those parables in Matthew 13 are interrelated. He says in the second parable that uh, while men slept, there came the enemy in and sowed false seed. Seed's the word of God. Now the enemy comes and sows false seed in the field. False seed. False scripture. False Bibles. You say, preacher, why do you always get so dogmatic about which Bible version? 
false Bibles because what happens in this parable, the false seed produces false believers. And false believers produce a false form of Christianity. They still call it that. They still say it's Christian, but it may not be Christian anymore. It has gotten so far away because of the false seed. And we know that the seed is the Word of God, and the Word of God is our base of truth, right? Amen. And so that's why we get people that, that sometimes religious people, they'll say some of the craziest things. Well, I know that's not what it says in the Bible. And it's because they have been reading a false seed. Now, and I don't, this is not a message on Scripture and the preservation of Scripture. Occasionally we'll preach on that, but understand that when the Word of God was given, it was forever settled in heaven. God gave it to man. And we understand that it was originally given primarily in Hebrew and Greek, given to us. And we understand that in the New Testament, even in Jesus' day, he taught from a Greek translation of the Hebrew Scriptures. That was the common Bible usage. And, uh, but yet, he calls it Scripture. A translation is called Scripture if it's an accurate translation. And all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Even an accurate translation is the Word of God. I don't have to have preach to you. Uh, how many here speak Greek and Hebrew? Wouldn't it be pretty foolish every Sunday I came here and preached to you in Greek and Hebrew? Some <laughs> preachers need to learn that because I'd get up all the whole message, Greek and Hebrew, Greek and Hebrew, Greek and Hebrew. Uh, I happen to speak English, and that's my native tongue. If we had another native tongue, then, you know, we can speak in that language. But I'm kind of limited. I speak hillbilly fluently, but that's yeah. about it. All right? But understand. Uh, and so uh, I haven't, I, I stand before you, and it's been researched, it has been followed. This is an accurate translation of the Greek and Hebrew, preserved by God, and with a stamp of approval on it historically was obvious. Did you know no, no revival, national revival, ever came out of preaching of Greek and Hebrew? But there's been national revivals that come out of preaching of this book. God has supernaturally put a stamp of approval on this book. And, uh, and what we call the Greek manuscript, the Textus Receptus, the received text. And then, uh, from that received text, our English translation, and by the way, your King James Bible is the only one translated from the Textus Receptus, the received text. That 200 or so other English translations are not from the Textus Receptus. So the inspiration has followed through the translation and the preservation. So I can stand here just as if I had Paul scroll in front of me of the, uh, of the epistles that he, that he wrote. I can say this is the Word of God. I can take my translation that is an accurate translation preserved of God and say I hold in my hand the Word of God. Right. It is just as much the Word of God. Now, in other languages, uh, we have other translations and I understand that. But I'm, I'm preaching to English speaking people this morning. So I got a King James Bible. And you understand, it is my basis of truth. And it's interesting, all those who put, come up with new, uh, all these new translations, they say, in comparison to the King James, if the King James is so bad, why do you keep comparing to it? Huh. Yeah. It's always the standard. Because it's the one that's right. It's the one that's accurate. It's the Word of God. Now, in this battle of trying to maintain truth, Sometimes people have to leave churches. Sometimes individuals say, I just can't stay there anymore and have to leave. Now, let me say that many times believers change churches. And people, some people change churches. We used to call them church hoppers. Yeah. They'll go to a different church every year. You know, go to leave this church, go join. You get in somewhere like the Midwest or you get down in the South, there's a Baptist church on every corner. You get some, every time this church has a revival meeting, they all come over and join that one. This church on the road has a revival. Everybody wants to go and join that one. Every time they get a new pastor, all they're excited. Everybody goes and join that one. Without any scriptural reasons to be leaving the church they're in. And so, what is the criteria? We seldom hear about somebody leaving the church over the doctrine. You seldom even hear that. Or biblical issues. The majority will leave because of personality clashes. Yes. Me and Brother Bob just can't get along. I'm leaving. I'm going to take my toys and go home. We're like little kids. And uh, I'll just, I'm, I'm not taking any more. You, you looked at me. I don't want to go in and look at me while I was preaching. I, and you know, and, and baby, 
lineage stuff that caused people to leave churches sometimes and, and go from church to church. The doctrine is not, not even the matter. It, and it's because of lack of spiritual growth, backsliding, pet peeves. Some believe because they believe they see issues that they just disagree. If, and I said this the other day to somebody, if you find two people, two thinking people, that agree on everything, one of them is not a thinking people. The thinking people disagree sometimes. But they but we, we don't have to agree on everything, but we have to agree on the basics. And we call those the fundamentals of the Christian faith. We can't disagree on whether Jesus is God or not and have fellowship together. We can't disagree that the Bible is the Word of God and still have fellowship together. We can't disagree that there's some other way of salvation other than Christ and still have fellowship together. But when we agree, we can't have fellowship together. Yes. Now, some listen to wrong advice from disgruntled, discontented members. Every church has them. Did you hear what the pastor said? I don't. I wonder what he really meant by that. I think he meant something by that. I just way he looked at me when he said it. He was talking about me. Some of you remember when a certain person got offended when an evangelist was here preaching because he used the expression and he said he was talking to me. And he got mad and walked out. Wasn't talking about he's talking about himself. And using his self example when the person got offended at. Now, there are others who leave because of family or friends or hurt feelings. Why? Number one, why should a person leave their church? Number one, if you move to a different place that's not reasonable to be traveling that distance. You find you a local church. Find you a local church. Uh, it would be pretty silly uh, somebody to move to uh, Philadelphia and be trying to commute every Sunday and be faithful to Ambassador Baptist Church. Wouldn't that be kind of silly? Find you a church in Philly. You said, but didn't find one like that. I can understand that. But, uh, no. but there are some good churches. And uh, if there's not one, start one. I mean, don't, don't go to some church that's not doctrinally right just because you said, I need to be a church. Find somebody to help you and start a church. Out of your, the church that you just left, they'll probably back you up and help you do it. If you adopt to them, they'll be pleased to see another work started. But uh, if you're moving out of the area, number two, if doctrinal heresy enters the church that has not been corrected, early days of our of our church, we met at the Hampton Inn. And one day, I stepped in the uh, the stairwell there, and uh, between Sunday school and church, and there was somebody had another first church member of our church cornered up there saying, "I don't care what Pastor Fry says about that. I think you can lose your salvation." Had him cornered up there, and I said, "Excuse me." Now, you know, I would not go to a church that tolerates. Well, you all believe what you want to believe. No, don't believe what we're going to believe. The Bible. The Bible says you have eternal life. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, whosoever believes should not perish, but everlasting life, not temporary life. Until you mess up, then God takes it back from you. No, no, no. That's not salvation. We understand. When they go into doctrinal heresy, you may have to leave. And they do sometimes. There, and there are some strange things that people begin to teach. Uh, I can't even... If Some of them I've found out through the years, you, you think, oh, no, surely nobody said that. But they have. They said some pretty crazy things from pulpits in churches. And you need to, you need to think about those things. If the doctrinal heresy is a good reason to get out. Number three, if there's proven immorality going on in the church that's not being dealt with by the church. Over in, I'm going to turn there very quickly, 1 Corinthians chapter 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1 says, reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication is not so much as named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife. Uh, in the church of Corinth, there was a man having an affair with his stepmother. All right, and ye are puffed up and have not rather mourned that ye have had, had done this my deed might be taken away from among you. Here the Apostle Paul says, look, you're puffed up. He said, we're really proud around our church. We'll accept, we're just willing to accept anybody no matter if they're committing fornication or they're living wicked. We don't care. We just love them. Paul said, I'll tell you what I'd do if I was there. 
I will deal with that problem when I get there. Listen, he says, this man needs to be dealt with. Notice he said, take it away from among you. And what's that mean? Take it out back and horse whip? What's that mean? He said, verily, as absent the body, but present the spirit, have judged already, as though I were present concerning him that has so done this deed. And so here's what the Spirit of God leads Paul to write. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you're gathered together in my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. And now what does that mean? We're going to, uh, we're going to turn somebody over Satan for the destruction of the flesh? I've been trying to tell us here, I've been preaching on this the last several weeks, how essential church is. The only authority a church has is to remove somebody from the church. You know, we don't have judicial authority. We, don't, we can't have an arrest and taken down the police station because of something that happened here at the church. We don't have that authority. Our authority is only if someone is so bad they've been going through privately and they've been going with uh, another group and then taken for the whole church and they've been disciplined. Our only authority is to remove them from that fellowship. And here, that is equated with turning them over to Satan. If you are a saved person and you have not identified with a local church, you are already under Satan's authority. He's working in your life, the devil is. He's working in your life to destroy you. The local church is that important. That to discipline somebody from a local church because of some moral infraction is to turn them over to Satan. That's pretty serious. That's pretty serious. I, I meet Christians all the time. So, uh, I've been saved for years, but I can't seem to get over that. No wonder. You're living in Satan's domain. Get you a local church. If not this one, find one that you can serve the Lord in. And serve Him in there. Be faithful there. And we find it. He says, next time they meet together in church, they were to turn that one over to Satan for the destruction of of the flesh that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. We can't, the church can't take away somebody's salvation. It takes, it puts them under the devil's jurisdiction in the flesh. Not the church can say, all right, hey, I don't like the way you're living. We're going to take your salvation back. It's been repoed. We're going to repo your salvation. Church doesn't have that authority. Church can't say you can't be saved because the church doesn't save you. Jesus does. That's right. Church can't take away something the church didn't give you. Church didn't give you salvation, Christ did. But what a church can do is discipline and, and take you out of their fellowship if someone's living an immoral life, and so that that person is now turned over to Satan. And so uh, sometimes people leave the church and step right into the hands of Satan when they leave the fellowship of the church. Well, why should people leave? Uh, moving to another area doctrinal heresy in the church, uh, proven immorality in the church. If the church no longer practices biblical Christianity, Acts chapter 2 defines these things. I won't take time. But listen, if they don't have soul winning, soul winning, there are good churches that are called fundamental Baptist churches that doctrinally are correct, but they never, nobody from that church ever goes out and tries to tell somebody how to get saved. Get out. That's not a good church. That is not a good church. Uh, you, you see, soul winning is not a ministry of the church. It is the church. It is what a church is about. Reaching lost people. Jesus came into the world to seek and to save that which was lost. Uh, the mission is not really a program of the church. Missions is the church. It's who we are. It's what we're about. It's finding people that are unsaved and giving them the gospel. Soul winning. Uh, if they ask them to, you know, and I've been a little bothered here that so few people make time to go so many. That, I look at our strength of our church as the number of people who go out each week and tell people how to get saved. That's the strength of Ambassador Baptist Church. The, the rest of them are dead weight so That's how I view it. I hope you have finance people going out and do it because you're not doing it. So many, a church that does not go so many is not a biblical New Testament church. I know that sounds strong because some of us grew up in, in around churches that called themselves fundamental Baptists, but didn't they just said, Well, we have a revival meet every year, and we tell, they tell them to come to church with you, hear the evangelists. The evangelists can't get them saved. We expect that that's that's why 
That's what destroys a lot of our independent Baptist churches because then the church gets built around the personality of a leader. The only personality we want to build around is the person of Jesus Christ. Amen. Not around this preacher. You're not here to be converted to Tom Fry. We're here to be converted to Jesus Christ. <coughs> He's the one. Let God be true and every man a liar. Yeah. I always tell folks, you know, if you're traveling across the country and you're looking for a church, I know you travel a lot. You've seen all kinds. You've walked in and said, oh, we're going to make it through this service. You see all kinds of churches. I tell you, if I look to see if they have buses or vans. If they have no buses or vans, I go on down the street to the next one. You say, why? Because we're to go into all the world and take the gospel to every creature. We're, we're to compel them to come in. We don't just put a sign and say, I'll come now if you won't get saved. That's not scriptural. The lost people are not commanded to go to the church. We're, the church is commanded to go to them. Understand? Uh, a church that doesn't emphasize the reaching of souls. Number two, a church that practices unscriptural baptism. Um, by unscriptural baptism, I mean sprinkle, dab them, uh, anything but total immersion. Anytime you find baptism in the Bible, they went under the water. They came up out of the water. It is after salvation. We don't, we don't baptize babies. If, if a church baptized a baby, I would move my membership yesterday. Because it's an unscriptural church. There is not one example of baptizing babies in your entire Bible. Not one. And so the very moment, and so we're going to, now I'm for baby dedication. We have parents come, bring that newborn child, and we pray with them that they'll be able to raise that child and nurture the admonition of the Lord. But we don't dip them, we don't dab them, we don't, you know, we don't, we don't sneeze on them, none of that. I mean, it's, it's immersion. When they get old enough to understand that they're a sinner and they trust Christ as their Savior, we baptize them. And then number three, do they have Bible preaching? Bible preaching. A lot of churches today, pastor will come out, sit on a little stool. I just want to wrap with you today on some of the issues of our day. I want to hear some preaching. I didn't come to church to hear you rap about some issue of the day. I want to hear preaching. Preach the word. Be instant, in season, out of season. Preach. There's so little preaching today. And, and many, much of it, by the way, and I'm not blaming a lot of the pastors because some of them know if they preach the Bible, half their congregation would leave in many churches. There are churches if that preacher got up and preached the Bible, half the people would get up and leave. Yeah. They don't want any part of it. They, they say, uh, no, just tell us smooth things. Tell us easy things. Tell us how wonderful we are. Build our ego of how nice we are. And I, you know, then you get to some church, you go down and guys say, you're going to hell unless you get behind it. Ooh, get me out of here. What kind of place is this? Maybe some place that really believes the Bible. Now, I'm not talking about being kind and so forth. You know what I'm talking about. But we have to preach the truth. And a church that will not preach the truth, hey, I want to know what they preach about abortion. I want to know what they preach about capital punishment. I want to know what they preach on, on, on the social issues of our day. I don't know. Are you going to preach the Word of God and not flinch no matter what the, the whatever the fad is of the week, you know? Uh, this is the fad now. Oh, you don't touch that. That's not politically correct. Uh, why would a preacher even consider whether it's politically correct or not? Is it what God said? In the discussion. Now, the preaching. I would leave a church that won't preach the Bible. Preach the Word. And then, godly living. I don't know why I don't watch it anymore, but I remember early days of my Christianity. Um, you remember when there were like three or four channels on TV? Some of you that old? Yeah. Not all these. And, uh, and you had to hang out the window and turn the antenna yeah. to get those channels. <laughs> there was a guy that came on years ago, and I don't even know why I bothered to even turn it on, but it would be like 11, 12 o'clock at night. There was a quote unquote Christian program. And the, the preacher, the pastor, they'd introduce this as pastor, doctor, so-and-so. And he was always sitting in his rocking chair with his open Bible. And he would say, oh, well, you know, those things have been preached and taught in these churches. Then he'd reach over and get his cigar out of his uh, ashtray, put his cigar back, 
And then he would show and get his cocktail, drink a little of that. And he said, well, you know, uh, that all that's all wrong. You just do the best you can. And we'll, when we, we'll let God take up whether we go to heaven or not when we get there. And we'll just, uh, we just not. And he would just go on and on. And, and he had a following. People, and every once in a while he'd throw a little profanity in them, them blankety blank Baptists telling there's only one way to heaven. Then he'd get, a, get his cocktail and drink it. Can you imagine who would even pay for his television time? Somebody was. To be on and to say such terrible things and such garbage. Listen, uh, get out of a church like that. Get out of it. I mean, just get out today and say, I'm not going back. And by the way, don't ever think that we're so secure that this church could not become that. Mm. You say, well, we're not that. You're right. But we could become that. Mm. There are churches who once were right down the line, but have become that. But our, that's why our faithfulness is to Christ our, and our, 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 our vows of commitment are to Christ not necessarily that particular church. We join that church and as long as that church stays right, I'm here. Count me in. But if you ever waver off into false preaching, false teaching, I'll be the first one to say, see y'all. So you can't leave, you're the pastor. Well, if it ever got to you, I'm sure one thing, I'm not the pastor. <laughs> that but pastors changed it. One of the largest churches in the Midwest City years ago. I knew the pastor. That, one of, it, that church had grown and they were evangelizing their city, doing great work for God. The pastor's wife go on vacation to Florida. While in Florida, they visit a modern, contemporary type of church. And they go and visit, and he's, he is taken in with them. Oh, this is wonderful. And he comes back to his church, his old-fashioned Bible-believing church, and he told his deacons, he said, well, this is the direction we're going to go from now on. And, and they said, well, wait a minute, that's just the opposite of what you taught us all along. You taught the Bible said this, the Bible taught that, and you mean we're going to abandon all that? He said, but this thing just, it's, it's, this is the new direction. This is the new direction of Christianity. This is the new way. And so this is the way we're going to go. By the way, that church does not exist today. It destroys. It's a cancer that eats away the congregation. We've got some of those kind of churches here, and I mean, they amaze me that they're still here, to be quite honest with you, because they usually implode. Because they have nothing that holds them together. Like when we stand on the Word of God, you have the Scriptures that are like glue, that's like glue that's holds you together. But when you abandon the Scripture, all you've got together is a personality, that pastor. But if that pastor ever leaves, it's gone. But it's built around that pastor. So we find, why should a person leave the church? They no longer practice biblical Christianity. They moved out of the area. The doctor of heresy. There's uh, proven immorality going on within the church. Right? Then, typical ways people leave the church. Stay with me now. Here's how some people leave the church. They don't tell anybody. We're just sneaking out. That's not responsible. Because if it's wrong, then you need to go to the leadership and tell them why you're leaving. Somebody needs to confront the leadership. Some often join another church without ever notifying their former church, and so they don't even know to take their name off the membership roll. They don't even notify them. They just their, their, their membership was about five or six different churches because they've never notified anybody that they've ever left. Some people don't try to resolve their problems with their pastor or the deacons or the Sunday school teachers when they do. Some justify their action with excuses. Well, I don't want to cause problems, but they do. I won't do any good. It won't do any good anyway. But they don't try. I know others who have tried and failed. They cannot give. They say who? Well, you know other people. Other people. Well, who? I don't know other people. Don't let the devil do that. Be open in your Christianity. Be, don't don't try to be a secret Christian at all. Be very open, transparent in what you do and why you do it. And, uh, and try to be blessed. If the day comes when you ought to leave because of scriptural reasons, don't you think there's probably other people ought to know that those are unscriptural things going on today? Yeah. You say, well, I don't want to hurt the church. It's not a church anymore. Yeah. It has wandered to being something else. 
calls it. And if it doesn't get corrected, Jesus said in, in Revelation, he said, I'll remove their candlestick. Mm. Mm. They don't get settled. <coughs> Desire is you want them to get settled. Proper way to leave a church. Leave it through testimony and time. Don't say things that are unkind. Don't gossip. Don't backbite. Don't try to split the church. But don't be trying to leave in the, the darkness of night. Either. But, but be kind to people. Say, look, here's the reason why I have to leave. We love you. And we're not trying to hurt you in any way. But this is why we must go. Pray and make sure you have biblical instruction in how you deal with it. Let me lastly give you a caution to churches. Don't build your church on other people's members. We don't, uh, somebody comes to our church, they got to they gotta say, uh, say Frederick Baptist down the road, they get mad at something the pastor says, and they show up here on Sunday and say, oh boy, they're good workers in the church. Yeah, let's get them. No, our desire is that they go back and try to resolve the problem. Yeah. We don't want them picking their problem from church to church. Some years ago, we had a couple who came to our church from Frederick Baptist. And they said, well, we had it out with the pastor. And I said, That's a, I said, I don't know anything about that. And I said, well, two things I will do. And I said, number one, I'm going to pray for you. And uh, God will give you wisdom of what you do. Number two, I'm going to call that pastor and tell him that you were here and what his issue is. Maybe he's got some things he needs to deal with. But I'm going to be very upfront about it. I called the pastor. And... Uh, and by God's grace, that couple got back in good terms with their pastor, went back to that church, and served the Lord there in that church ever since. Amen. Amen. And that's what we wanted. We're not, we're not trying, we're not trying, when, when a person goes to the community to start a church, like we moved here and started the church many years ago, the preacher said, we don't need another Baptist church in Frederick. And you know what they were worried about? That we're going to go and visit all their members trying to steal their members. Hey, there are enough lost people in Frederick, you don't have to go out and steal anybody else's church. That's right. Anymore. That's right. There are enough people in Frederick. Why? In fact, if we had a hundred churches, there's room for them in Frederick. Amen. Bible-believing churches. Uh, churches that love the lost, trying to do right. And we ought to encourage them. Not be uh, trying to destroy them. Say, oh boy, if somebody got mad at that church, maybe they'll come to our church. That's not our... We're to go and bring the gospel to the unsaved and help people. Don't build your church on other man's foundation. Don't allow someone else in sin at one church, bring it over to you. I think of a preacher right now, years ago, has some more problems. The church said, well, we don't want anybody to find out about it. So he was removed as pastor. And uh, they, what they did say, you need to resign or we will have to remove this pastor. He went to the great state of Texas and began pastoring the church. In a little while, he had the same number of problems. The church there had no idea that why he had left the other church. They had been left in the dark. And many times that's how things go. Don't don't uh, take on some of these things in the, our church. But and, and if we need to be wise about what we do. Listen, it's not about me. It's not about you. It's about the gospel of Jesus Christ Amen. and holding Jesus with the highest integrity. He's a wonderful Savior. And we should not want anything that I do or anything you do to be a blemish to that. A blemish to the wonderful Savior. And you understand. Uh, why should we leave the church? Well, there are times when you need to. They may come, but you shouldn't leave here. They may come, I should leave here. The truth is, we'll leave the right way and for the right reasons. Don't you think? We need to leave. And uh, I pray that we don't leave. Don't, don't, don't move back on anywhere. Okay? I'm not going anywhere. Uh, you say, you know some preacher we don't mind. I didn't say that. But we're holding high this essential church. Church is important. And for a Christian not to be in right standing with a local church is to be turned over to Satan for the destruction of their flesh. That's pretty serious. That is very serious. Be faithful to your church. Find you one that you can be faithful to. That's doctrinally right. That's right. <coughs> and then serve the Lord. Our Father, we pray that you take these thoughts now. Lord, the essential church. The world doesn't think church is important. doesn't think it's essential. But Lord, you teach us that it's absolutely uh, necessary for me to be a good Christian is to make much of the church you put me in. The place that you planted me, I'm to grow there. 
I'm to serve there. I'm going to learn to love you more there. I'm going to learn to love people more there. Because that's where you have planted me. Help us, Lord, not to make take it lightly. Help us to take it very seriously. Our church attendance, our church membership. And Lord, uh, help us to make much of it, Lord. And Lord, help us not to be ones that would be with every wind of, of change and fad that's out there. Help us not to be moved by those things and say, I'm people of the truth. I want to be those who follow the Word of God and with stability, no matter what may come. In Jesus' name we pray. Let's stand to our feet, heads bowed, and eyes closed. I challenge you today, if this is your home church, pray for you, Master Baptist Church. There are, there are trends, there are temptations, there are things that will pull us one way or another and get us off of being in the state, build up on the Word of God. So pray for us. Pray for me. Pray for the church leaders. Because uh, one of us get out of step with the will of God and, and much damage can be done. So pray for us. And you say, well, I, I pray for you, but uh, what else? Pray for each other. Occasionally, you're going to get discouraged and pray that, that God will send somebody alongside and encourage you. And you see somebody else get discouraged, you pray that God will show it to you so you can go alongside them and encourage them. So we act as a body, glorifying Christ and serving Him. As just a merry place of verse of invitation to come. Will you commit yourself to holding high your church? Maybe you say, without this is not my church. Well, wherever it is, pray for it. Hold it up high. The Bible says that Christ loved the church and gave him the <coughs> Hold high this thing of church. So, well, I could be a good Christian. I, uh, I don't have to go to church. Oh, you can get to heaven without going to church, but you can't be a good Christian without being a Muslim church. It's bad we I'll close with this little account. I got a young couple came to the office one day and said, We want to get married. They said, we want you to marry us. And I said, I'm already married. Yeah. But uh, uh, they said, we'd like you to perform the ceremony. And I said, well, that's fine. Let me talk to you a little bit. And I always, I never tell somebody immediately because I want to hear what they're both saved. I want to hear their salvation testimonies. And so I want to marry a saved person and not a saved person together. And uh, and so I, I had them both, they were both saved. And I, I said, well, and you come to me, well, where do you normally go to church? And they told, I thought they maybe just moved there. I said, no, they told me where they live. And they told me the church. And I said, Okay, I know that church. That's a pretty good church. And uh, why are you here? So, well, we just had a falling out with the pastor. And I said, really? And I said, uh, and they begin to, you know, be very vague about what the falling out was over and all that. And I said, well, I, I'd love to help you any way I can, but uh, well, the only way that I would uh, perform the wedding ceremony, since you're a member of that church and he's your pastor, then you're going to have to go to him and try to resolve this. I said, I know enough about people. It may not be them. You may not be able to resolve it. I don't know. That pastor could have a bad attitude, a bad spirit about it. I said, I don't have any control of that, but you have control of yourself. You need to go to him and talk to him and try to resolve the issues. Well, the pastor called me a couple days later. Thank me. He said, thank you for sending those, that couple back. He said, uh, we got everything worked out. We have, a, And I appreciate you doing that. And he said, that shows such integrity. And he said, this young couple, they're a good couple. But he said, they just kind of had some people that kind of misguided them a little bit, gave them some bad counsel. And, and I said, well, uh, are you going to perform the wedding ceremony? He said, no, I'm not. He said, I want you to. Mm. He said, uh, look, he said, there's been some damage done here in our church by some things that they said and accusations made. And he said, I'm actually counseling them to go to your church. Yeah. He said, that they trust you, and I love this couple, and I want only the best for them. And he said, uh, I'd like for you to perform the wedding ceremony, and uh, I'd like to attend and give them my blessing. Yeah. And he did, and we just and, and God brought both churches in sweet fellowship together, and this young couple did join our church and serve the Lord as Sunday school teachers in our church for a good number of years. But they, they went back and tried to resolve the difference. Rather than just bringing a bitter spirit to our church that they had, they went back and tried to resolve it. And listen, sometimes things can't be resolved. But we all try, don't we? We all try. 
in this couple did, it was very successful. And that, that passion, I mean, actually became closer friends because of that whole issue. And, uh, and by the way, he's still pastoring in that same community. Still there, good, good job. All right, well, let's pray. Father, we pray that you go with us now and pray that you will guide and direct our lives. Lord, keep us close to you, Lord. You know how the devil sends his antichrist along to pull us and sway us and, and give us a bad spirit, a bad attitude toward things and about toward one another. Help us, Lord. Keep, keep us a sweet spirit, a loving attitude toward each other and toward you. We know that we're being shot at by the enemy every day in, in ways of philosophies and false doctrines. Help us just to love you and stay close to you and be used of you, Lord. There are people that are, do not know you, Lord, that are depending upon us loving them and praying for them and taking them the gospel. Please use us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.